Today in the workshop, we're working with DC motor drivers. You'll see how to use several H-Bridge motor drivers with an Arduino or any microcontroller. We'll also drive some motors, large ones, small ones, and in between. We're in the driver's seat today, so welcome to the workshop. Well, hello and welcome to the workshop where we're going to be making motors move today. And we're going to be using a wide variety of motors, ranging from small motors that only require 3 volts DC to large motors that consume a lot more voltage and current. And we're going to be driving our motors with a series of different H-Bridge motor drivers. And that's what we're going to learn today, how to use these different H-Bridge motor drivers. Now, I'm going to be using an Arduino Uno for our experiments today, but you could use pretty well any microcontroller or any microcomputer. The key takeaway is you'll learn how to control both the speed and direction of your DC motor and it turns out there's actually three different methods that they use to accomplish this. So let's get started by looking at what the requirements are for a motor driver. The motor drivers we're working with today are for use with a DC motor which is probably the simplest type of motor there is. Just apply voltage to the terminals of the motor and the shaft will rotate in one direction. Reversing the polarity of the voltage applied to the motor will cause the shaft to rotate in the opposite direction. There are many specifications involved when choosing a DC motor, but when choosing a DC motor driver to match your motor, there are three motor specs you need to look at. The first is the motor voltage. This is the voltage the motor operates at, and your driver should be able to comfortably handle this voltage. The average current is the amount of current that the motor will consume under a normal load condition, and your driver needs to be specified to handle this average current, preferably with a little bit of headroom. The motor stall current is the amount of current that the motor will draw if the shaft has been seized or held in place, and your motor driver needs to be able to have a peak current capability to handle this situation. A motor driver is inserted between the power source and the motor, and it allows control signals from a microcontroller to control the motor. There are signals for the speed and signals for the direction. Some motor drivers also require a logic voltage that comes from the microcontroller. This is separate from the motor voltage. The motor drivers we're looking at today use what is called an H-bridge configuration, which is the most popular configuration for controlling the speed and direction of DC motors. An H-bridge looks like an H when it's drawn out schematically, and it can be drawn as four switches. When two of the switches are closed, current will be applied to the motor in one polarity, and in this case the motor will spin clockwise. Closing the other two switches will cause the voltage to be applied to the motor in the opposite polarity, and in this case spinning it counterclockwise. Of course, in real life we don't use physical switches for an H-bridge. One method of building an H-bridge uses bipolar transistors. When current is applied to the base of two of the transistors, they act like switches and drive the motor. However, one issue is that on a bipolar transistor, there will be a voltage drop of about 0.7 of a volt on each transistor. This means there will be a total voltage drop of 1.4 volts, so your motor will receive 1.4 volts less than the voltage applied to the driver. This extra voltage is dissipated as heat, so drivers using bipolar transistors often require large heat sinks. A more efficient method of building an H-bridge is to use MOSFETs. By applying a voltage to the gate of the MOSFETs, they'll act as switches. However, unlike the bipolar transistor, the voltage drop is extremely low, usually 0.1 of a volt or less. This means that very little voltage is dissipated through the MOSFETs, and some of these designs don't even require heat sinks. We control the speed of our DC motors using PWM. PWM is an acronym that means Pulse Width Modulation. Pulse Width Modulation allows us to drive the motor at slower speeds but still retain the full torque capabilities. With PWM, the width of the pulse determines how fast the motor will rotate. If we send pulses with very tiny widths, the motor will rotate quite slowly. 
Increasing the width of the pulse will cause the motor to rotate faster. A further increase causes it to rotate even faster. Note that in all three examples, the frequency of the pulse stays the same, it's just the width that we're varying. If the pulse is brought down and held at a zero or low state, the motor will stop. Holding the pulse to a high state will cause the motor to run at full speed. It should be noted, however, that some high-powered H-bridge drivers do not recommend driving a motor at over 98% speed. The motor drivers we're examining today have three different methods of controlling speed and direction. The first method involves a PWM input plus two control lines. On some of these drivers, the PWM input is called the enable input. The truth table illustrates how the two inputs control the speed of motor rotation. Note that when both inputs are held low, the motor is stopped. On some motor drivers, both inputs being high will cause the motor driver to implement a brake function. This should be used cautiously as it can cause a lot of current to be drawn by the motor and in some cases can even burn out a motor coil. The simplest method is to use a PWM input and one input for the direction control. The direction control simply drives the motor forward or backward depending on the state of the input. The most popular control input among all the different controllers we're looking at today is one that uses two PWM inputs. In this particular case, holding both inputs low will stop the motor, and if you want to go forward or reverse, you hold one input low and put PWM into the other one. Note that holding both inputs high is not a legal condition, so you should avoid doing this. Today we're going to be examining the operation of several different motor drivers. Some of these drivers are dual drivers and some of them are single drivers, and they have a wide range of voltage and current capabilities. So let's go and take a look at those drivers now. Now here are the motor drivers that we're going to be working with today and as you can see there are quite a range of sizes over here, also quite a range of capabilities. We've got some very small drivers down here as well as some very large ones over here. Some of these things use large heat sinks like this one and this one and these ones here. Well, the rest of these don't even use any heat sinks. This board over here, which is probably the most powerful driver that we have, is also a controller and it comes with both a potentiometer and a direction switch. So you can use it on a standalone basis if you want to. It's also a five volt power supply, so it can supply power for the microcontroller you're using to drive it. Now, some of these devices power two motors, while others just power one motor. And we're going to see how we can use all of these motor drivers today. Now the first motor driver that we're going to look at today is a classic. It's the L298N and this is a two-channel H-bridge controller. You've probably used this before. I've used them in projects, although I don't tend to use them in new designs because there are better choices than the L298N and I'll show you that in a moment. Nonetheless, it's very important to learn how to use this specific driver. As I said, it is a very common driver and it has a fairly unique way of controlling the speed and direction. And so let's go and examine the L298N. The L298N is a very popular dual H-bridge motor driver. It can handle a motor voltage from 5 to 35 volts. It can supply a continuous current of 2 amperes and a peak current of 3.5 amperes. The L298N accepts a logic voltage from 3.3 to 5 volts. It also accepts a logic voltage supply of 5 volts, although you can strap it to use the motor voltage supply and eliminate the requirement for this. Looking at the L298 board, we see three screw connectors. The one with three terminals on it is the power connector. It has the motor plus, the ground connection, and the 5 volt logic input. There is a strap on the board and as long as your motor V plus is higher than 7.5 volts, you can put the strap in and eliminate the need for the 5 volt logic input. The other two terminals are for motor A and motor B. The DuPont connector at the front has two straps on enable A and enable B. 
These strap these pins high so that the motors are always enabled. And if you only want to use this to control motor direction, you can eliminate the connection to ENA and ENB and just use the straps. If you want to control the motor speed, however, pulse width modulation is applied to the ENA pins. IN1 and IN2 control motor A, and IN3 and IN4 control motor B, and you can see the control signals on the table here. Now here's a typical hookup of the L298N to an Arduino Uno. Note that there are many ways of hooking up this controller. The key requirement is that the ENA and ENB pins are pulse width modulation IO pins, as they are in this connection. If you are using a motor supply of over 7.5 volts, you can eliminate the connection from the Arduino's 5 volts and just use the jumper on the motor controller board. If you're using the 5 volts from the Arduino, you need to remove the jumper. Now here are a couple of L298N motor driver modules. Uh, this is probably the more common style that you're going to run into, but you can also find these ones as well. Both of them feature a very large heat sink, and this heat sink is required because the L298N is actually a bipolar transistor device, it's not a MOSFET device, so it dissipates a lot of its energy as heat, and for that reason it's not the most efficient motor controller. For battery powered devices you should be aware that you're using your batteries to heat up the motor controller, and there are better choices. Nonetheless, it is a very popular controller and you're sure to run into it. It's got terminals here for connecting to two motors. Another terminal for connecting power supply, both motor and logic supply. Now there's a strap on the board you can use to use the motor supply as a logic supply and eliminate the need for the logic power supply. You have to have at least 7.5 volts on your motor supply for that to work. Over here are all the inputs, including the two enabled. There's also the ability to strap the enables high if you want to just run this constantly at full speed. So now let's go and put this motor driver to use. So here's a sketch that we're going to be using to demonstrate the L298N, and of course you'll find thousands of examples of sketches for the L298N as it's a very popular driver. They all start off the same by defining the connections to the motor driver, and so these are our connections here. Of course you could use different pin numbers if you wanted to, but just remember that ENA and ENB have to be PWM capable pins. Now in this sketch I've defined two functions. One called motor excel, another one called motor decel, and I think you can probably guess what they do. Motor excel increments from 0 up to 255, and then writes that value to both ENA and ENB with an analog write, and that'll produce pulse width modulation to change the speed of the motor. And then we add a short delay, step up one more, etc, etc. Motor decel does the same thing except it decrements from 255 to 0. Now we'll go into the setup. In the setup we have to define all of our pins as being outputs. And then we're going to start by turning our motors off. And so we use IN1 through IN4 and set them all low. And if you look at the truth table, that's a stop on all of the motors. And then we also, just for good luck, do an analog rate of zero to both ENA and ENB. So we're not sending any pulse width modulation as well. Now we go into the loop, and it's just basically a set of commands to move the motors forward, to move them backwards, and to move them in opposite directions, because we're driving two motors, of course. So we'll set them all forward by toggling IN1 through IN4 accordingly, and you can look at that truth table I showed you earlier to see how that makes the motors go forward. Then we'll call our two functions to accelerate and decelerate, and add a half second delay. We do the same thing for reverse, so we change the values over here, do accelerate, decelerate, delay, then we'll set them in opposite directions and do the same thing and delay. And then we'll put everything down to a stop over here by putting ENA and ENB to zero, delay for half a second, and repeat the loop. So our motors will be moving forwards and backwards when we run this. And so it's a pretty simple sketch and it shows you how simple it is to work with the L298N. Now let's take a quick look at it in action. 
So here's the demonstration that I've hooked up for my L298N, and for this demo I'm using a couple of the yellow motors that are so commonly used for robot car designs, and I'm sure you've used these motors before, and you probably know that the tolerance on these things is a little bit off. I'm finding this motor is a lot more sluggish than this motor over here, and I have reversed the wires just to make certain it's the motor and not my driver. And speaking of my driver, here's my L298N there. Down here hooked up of course to an Arduino Uno and you might notice that I've got a five battery battery pack I've got seven and a half volts even though I just want to deliver six volts to my motor I need seven and a half to combat the 1.4 volts that I'm going to lose in the heat sink over here on the L298N so let's just hook this up and look at our demo in action and you can hear that little whining sound that's the pwm it makes that sound when you're at a low level that isn't high enough to turn the motors the motors are actually kind of resonating they act a bit like a speaker but as you can see it does work it moves the motors backwards and forwards accordingly as our sketch uh, was laid out to do and so really there's not much more to it this is a very simple motor driver to use but as i said it's a bit inefficient because i'm losing a whole battery's worth of voltage in this heat sink and there are other drivers that we can use to replace it so as we've seen, the L298N is a very simple motor driver to work with. However, we've also seen that it's not the most efficient. And there are more modern motor drivers that you could use to replace the L298N. Now, you might want to replace the L298N just simply for performance reasons, to get a more improved design that doesn't dissipate all that heat and is more efficient with batteries. You might also want to replace it with a single-channel motor driver, because if you're only driving one motor it seems kind of senseless to use a dual channel one so we're going to look at three different drivers that we can use to replace the L298N and the first one is actually a pin for pin replacement that you could drop into your circuit right now and improve its performance with the TB6612FNG is a very popular dual H-bridge motor controller that is a replacement for the L298N in many applications it doesn't have quite the same motor voltage range as the L298N, supporting only 4.5 to 13.5 volts. Its continuous current is also less than the L298N, 1.2 amperes, but it has a peak current of 3.2 amperes, which is close to the L298N, and these specifications allow it to control a lot of those hobbyist motors that we commonly use in L298N for. The TB6612FNG accepts a logic voltage of 2.7 to 5.5 volts. It has a VCC input that you need to attach your logic voltage to. Now here are the pinouts of the TB6612FNG. It's a very simple module to work with and it's breadboard friendly. You can see that one of the pins on here is labeled STBY. This is the standby pin, and it needs to be pulled high in order for the motor driver to be enabled. You can pull this up to the logic voltage, or you can connect it to an I.O. pin and control it with your microcontroller. You can see from the truth table here that the logic for the TB6612FNG is identical to that of the L298N. The PWM pins on the TB6612FNG have the same purpose as the enable pins did on the L298N. Now from this hookup diagram with an Arduino Uno, you can see that I've used the same connections that I did with the L298N. Once again, you can use several different connection schemes with this motor driver. The key requirements is that the PWMA and PWMB pins need to be connected to I.O. ports that are PWM capable. Also note that the standby pin has been pulled up to 5 volts in order to enable the motor driver. 
Now here are a couple of TB6612FNG motor drivers and these devices are often used in circuits where you would use an L298N because of the improved performance. Another reason they are used is because of their difference in size and let me show you that. Here is an L298N module and as you can see I could just about fit four of these little modules into the space of this module. Also there is no big heat sink on on this. In fact, the only reason this is so tall right now is because I've soldered leads onto it. Now, I've got two of these modules over here, and they are identical in many respects. They're the same pinouts, the same functionality, and the same features. This one over here is made by SparkFun, and this is a generic module. And one thing about the SparkFun module, which I like a lot, is that if you can see that they've got all of the pinouts written on both sides of the module whereas the generic one only has it on the bottom side which on a solderless breadboard isn't very handy when you've got this plugged into the breadboard but they can both be used in our circuits and so now let's go and put it to use. Now since the TB6612FNG is a replacement for the L298N, we can just continue to use the same code without any modifications. So we could, for example, use the last example sketch and run our motors with the TB6612FNG. Now with both of these drivers, we can also use a library, and there are a number of L298N libraries to choose from. Now this one is one that I particularly like simply because it is well documented. It's made by someone named Andrea Lombardo, and as you can see, it's even had an update 16 months ago, which uh, really is something when you consider this the driver has been around for years and years. There's probably not too much that can be updated. But again, what I like about this library is the documentation over here. There's quite a bit of documentation on GitHub for how to use the various methods of the library, and uh, you can get it directly from your Arduino IDE. So we'll go into our IDE. DE and go into Library Manager and you can just filter by L298N and you'll see it right here the L298N by Andrea Lombardo look I've already installed mine but you can click on the install button if you have not and then we can go and take a look at some of the examples that come with the library and if we go down to the library here it is You'll see there's quite a few of them. Now there are a number of examples that say callback on them, and those are interesting examples. What he's implemented is a method of having a callback function called every five seconds while the motor driver is being driven. And so you could use that to perhaps check status or something and see if you need to modify the speeds of your motor. There's also two groups. You'll notice there's L298N and L298NX2. And what the N ones are, are just to drive a single motor. In the X2 ones, you create a different object to drive two motors. And so we're going to use one of those. And we're going to use the simple one over here. So we're going to bring that one up. And he explains there that the L298 uh, NX2 is not a new version of the module. It's just a double implementation of the library. And so you include that library. You define all of your pins, and so you'll need to change those around to use our examples because his are a bit different. And uh, basically you create one object over here and give it all of your pin definitions and then you can work with the object. He's using the serial monitor to print something. Uh, there's a, a command called set speed. So he sets an initial speed for the motors. He can tell them to go forward. Uh, this print some info is a function that he's got at the very end here that just prints some information about the current motor status. And so he just runs through some of the commands to go forward and to ba go backwards, etc set the different speeds of the different motors and a few delays. And so you can use this and the uh, commands that you saw up on GitHub to experiment with this library. So I'm running the example right now on uh, the TB6612FNG. The only thing that I've done to the example to change it is I've changed these to match the pinouts that we have, but otherwise it's identical. So let's take a look at that in action now. 
Now here's a demonstration of the TB6612FNG, and I've got it hooked up to the same motors that I used for the L298N experiment, and I've got it hooked up, of course, to my Arduino, and you'll note that I'm using a four battery battery pack right now because I'm not losing all of that extra voltage inside the transistors on this device because it's MOSFET based, and so I can just use six volts to power my six volt motor. Now I've got it loaded up with that live library sketch that we uh, just looked at and of course that just manipulates both the speed and direction of the motors so we'll power it up and we'll watch it go. And it seems to work pretty well. So as you can see, the TB6612FNG is a pretty viable replacement for the L298N. It's certainly a much smaller board, and it also reduces the amount of voltage that you're going to need for your motor, and you're not expending all that excess voltage out as heat. So all in all, I think this is an excellent choice for a lot of small robot car designs and things like that. The Adafruit DRV8871 is a single channel H-bridge module with very impressive specifications for its size. It can handle a motor voltage from 6.5 to 45 volts. It can supply a continuous current of 2 amperes and a peak current of 3.6 amperes, so it's on par with the L298N in this respect. The device can accept a logic voltage of 3.3 to 5.5 volts, and you don't need to supply this device with a logic voltage supply, as it derives all of its supply voltage from the motor voltage. Now here is the pinout of the DRV8871 module, and as you can see it's very simple. In order to spin the motor forward, you need to apply a pulse width modulated signal to IN1 while keeping IN2 low. If you keep IN1 low and apply a PWM signal to IN2, you can spin the motor in reverse. Note that there are two connections for the motor V+. These are just internally connected together. And here is the hookup of the DRV8871 to an Arduino Uno. Note that the hookup is very simple as it only requires two inputs plus a ground. The two inputs can be connected to any PWM capable pins. I show them connected to Arduino's pins 9 and 10 in this diagram. Now this is the Adafruit DRV8871 module and it's a very very tiny little module so if you're looking for a very small motor driver for a small motor this is an ideal selection. Now when you buy this it doesn't come with the terminals soldered on or with the pins on it. They give you the terminals and pins and you solder it yourself which is actually kind of nice because you might have an alternate application in which you don't want to use the terminals or you might want to put the pins on the top on their application note I noticed they did that but I put them on the bottom so they're easy to use with a solderless breadboard so really not much to see here a very tiny little module that can power a wide range and a wide voltage of motors now here's a simple sketch that we can use with the DRV8871 H-Bridge driver and we're going to start off by just defining the connections that we've made to it and remember these have to be PWM capable pins if you want to change them. Now we go into the setup and in the setup we define both of those connections as being outputs and we set them both low because that'll stop the motor. Then we're going to go into the loop and in the loop basically we're just going to accelerate and decelerate the motor in both a four forward and reverse direction. And so we're going to start off by accelerating forward. Now with this controller, of course, we hold one of the inputs low while applying PWM to the other input. So in this case, we're going to hold IN1 low, and then we're going to go and step through an integer from 0 to 255 and do an analog right of that integer to, to IN2. And so that'll create a PWM signal over there. We'll apply a short delay and do it all over again. 
Decelerate is the same thing except we're decrementing right now. We've already still got IN1 set low, so we don't need to set it again. We'll put a delay in there of half a second. And then we're going to go in reverse. So now we're going to put IN2 low, and then we're going to manipulate IN1 from 0 to 255. And then for decelerate, we're going to step it down from 255 to 0. So it's pretty simple the way that this operates. And let's load it up and take a look at it. And so here's my little demonstration of the DRV8871. The driver itself is on this solderless breadboard, and it's driving this small fan. You may have seen this fan in a few of my other videos. It's just one that I hooked onto a perf board so I could experiment with it. And it's a 6-volt uh, motor, but it actually can handle voltages up to about maybe 9 or 10 volts as well, too. And that's a good thing because you'll notice that I'm powering it with 7.5 volts. And you might wonder why. After all, this is a MOSFET-based driver. It doesn't have any problem with dropping voltage or exhibiting a lot of heat. You can see it has no heat sink. The reason for that is that the minimum voltage for the motor voltage that you can use here is 6.5 volts, and that's because there's an onboard voltage regulator here. Remember, we don't hook any logic voltage from the Arduino to this device. We only hook up our inputs and our ground connection. Uh, the voltage for the logic is derived from the motor control voltage and there's an onboard regulator and I think the 6.5 volts must be the minimum requirement for that. So let's just power this up and watch it work. And we can see it powers up the motor and accelerates and decelerates and now it should just be doing it in the reverse direction. There it is. And so pretty simple. It's a pretty simple driver to work with. You just have the two input leads. You send PWM to one of them and you hold the other one low. And if you want the motor stopped, you hold them both low. And uh, it's a very small driver. It can handle voltages up to 55 volts. So uh, for a lot of motors, that'll be very handy. And so for a lot of your projects, if you only need one motor, this would be an excellent driver to choose. The MX1508 is a dual H-bridge motor controller that is often advertised as a replacement for the TB6612FNG. However, it is not actually pin-for-pin -pin compatible with this device, although it has similar specifications. It can handle a motor voltage of 2 to 10 volts. It can supply a continuous current of 1.5 amperes and a peak current of 2.5 amperes. This device accepts a wide range of logic voltages from 1.8 to 7 volts. You only need to supply the motor voltage and it internally supplies its own logic power supply. Now here are the pinouts for the MX1508 Dual H Bridge Controller. Note that this controller is not compatible with solderless breadboards or perf boards as the pins aren't aligned on a 0.1 inch grid. There is only one power supply on the device, the motor supply. This is used to derive the logic supply. You can see how the device operates from the truth table. This device works by accepting a pulse width modulation signal on input number IN1 or IN3 and a low signal on IN2 or IN4 in order to spin the motor forward. To spin the motor in reverse, you hold IN1 or IN3 low and apply a PWM signal to IN2 or IN4. It also has a standby and a break mode. Now here's the connection of the MX1508 Dual H bridge to an Arduino Uno. You can use different pins if you wish, but all of the I.O. pins need to be PWM compatible. If you've got a couple of small DC motors and you're looking for an inexpensive way to power them, then the MX1508 is an ideal choice. About the only negative thing I can say about this module is the spacing on the pins makes it not friendly for solderless breadboards or perf boards. In fact, these two pins which do the power aren't even 0.1 of an inch apart, so it's a little bit difficult to solder pins onto it. Of course, you could always disconnect wires directly to to the board as well. But other than the difficulty in doing some soldering and working on a breadboard, this is a great little module and it's very inexpensive. 
Now, if you look at the input requirements for the MX1508, you'll find that they are basically identical to the ones for the DRV8871, the only difference being, of course, that the MX1508 has two motor driver channels, whereas the DRV8871 only had one. So we could use the code from the last sketch and just double it up for a second motor. Another thing we could do is go searching for a library, and there aren't very many libraries for this motor driver, but there is one over here that I found on on GitHub, and it does have some documentation to it. There doesn't have that many functions in it, but it has basically what you would need to drive the motor. So this is an alternative method of driving it, and we can get that library directly from the library manager in our Arduino IDE. So we'll go and I'll filter it already here by MX1508, and as you can see, I've got two results, one that's made specifically for the ESP32, and another one over here, the one that we were just looking at on GitHub. So I've got that installed right now, and uh, what we can do is take a look. There are only two examples with this library. And they're over here. There's one to run the PWM at a 16-bit resolution. Unfortunately, with an Arduino Uno, you can only do that with two of the PWM pins. So to do both motor channels, you would require four. Another one is this example, MX1508. And we'll go and launch that. And so this example basically steps you through what you need to do to find pins. You create an object for the motor, and then you can go and manipulate the motor. And he basically just steps it up and down and only goes up and down to 100, which doesn't drive it very fast. But then he just basically uses a motor go PWM command to go and drive the motor at that speed. So motor go is the command that he uses to drive the motor. Um, and he also shows you how he would set the direction up over here as well. Now, uh, this is a good example, except it only does one of the motors on the driver. And you could load this up and it'll drive one of the motors. But if you want to drive two, you need to modify it. And that's exactly what I have done over here. So this is the exact same sketch. What I've done is I've added two more pin definitions over here. I've created a second motor object. So that's motor B over here. And then down at the very bottom, I just added the motor B go PWM. So if you want to modify that, you can go ahead. I'll put a copy of this modified version up with the downloads that's on the article that accompanies this video. So you can grab that off of the dronebotworkshop.com website as well. So at any rate, let's load this up and watch it work. So I've got a little demonstration hooked up with the MX-1508, and for this demonstration I've decided to go with a couple of smaller motors. Now the deal with these two motors is they're actually rated from 1 to 6 volts, so they are very low voltage motors, and I'm powering them, as you can see, with 3 volts. So that's rather interesting in the fact that I'm using 5 volt logic to power a device that is only taking 3 volts. And of course, you don't bring any logic supply to this motor driver, you just power it off of the uh, motor power supply. So it's uh, pretty interesting. It'll work down at that voltage. So if you're looking for something to use with very small motors, this is probably a good selection. Now one thing about this I've already mentioned is that it is not solderless breadboard friendly. It uh, doesn't have the pin spaced out in most cases at 0.1 of an inch. It also uh, has more pins in a row than you could possibly put onto a breadboard because they short each other out. And so I've wired over to it, as I showed you earlier, with a bunch of DuPont pins. I actually soldered the wires for the power on there because I found the connections kind of flaky. And I would recommend if you are using this in a design that you consider soldering all of the wires directly to it. You could put connectors somewhere else on the wires. But um, it isn't that friendly as far as that goes. There's also only one mounting hole for the device. But uh, with those restrictions aside, it's very inexpensive and very good for powering these tiny motors. So I've got our demonstration over here, and we'll just get it going. Now once again, I've got one motor that's more sluggish than the other motor. This one over here is a little bit slower to respond. And as a matter of fact, I've got them reversed now because I wanted to make certain once again that I didn't have a problem with the driver, but it is indeed the motor. And so here's our demo that basically sends them forwards and backwards. And of course, we're using the library to do that. Come on, you can do it. There you go. 
And so there you go. If you're looking to power very tiny motors, this is an excellent choice as a motor driver. So we've already looked at four different motor drivers, and we can see that for small motors, between the four of them, there is probably a perfect selection for your project. But what if we have a very large motor, one that consumes a lot of current? Obviously the drivers we've looked at so far won't do the trick, but there are larger drivers that we can use that can handle a great deal of current. So let's take a look at a couple of them right now. The DBH-12 is a dual DC motor driver with impressive current capabilities and it's part of the DBH-1 series of drivers. This driver will support a motor voltage from 5 to 14.5 volts. It can handle a continuous current of 20 amperes and a peak current of 30 amperes. The DBH-12 supplies its own logic power supply and uses a logic voltage of 3.3 to 12 volts. Here's the pinout of the DBH-12 module. Note from the truth table that this motor is controlled in the same method that the DRV-8871 is, by applying a PWM input to one pin and a low input to the other pin, we can control both the speed and direction. There is an IN1 and IN2 pin for both channels A and B. The EN line is the enable line and this is internally held high. You can pull this down to ground to disable the bridge. CT is the current monitor and this can be fed out to an analog input if you wish to monitor the current consumption of the H bridge. One important note with this H-bridge is that you should never drive it at 100% speed. You should not go over 98% speed with your pulse width modulation signal. Another important note is that the V-plus pin on the connector is connected to the same motor V-plus on the terminal strip. And this is an input, not an output. There are many diagrams on the internet that show this as being an input and show it being connected to the logic voltage on your microcontroller. This is not true and doing this will destroy your microcontroller. Now here's the way that you hook a DBH-12 up to an Arduino Uno. As you can see there is no power sent from the microcontroller, only a ground connection. Otherwise, we're just using the four input pins, IN1 and IN2, for channels A and B. You can change the pin assignments if you wish, but remember, all of these pins need to be able to support pulse width modulation. Now, the DBH-12 is a much larger module and is capable of driving two very large motors. Um, the module has a connector on this end. It's got uh, six screw terminals and four of these are for the two motors which are on the outside and on the inside you've got the power supply for the motor. Now on this side we've got two rows of pins and this is where you connect the input uh, from your microcontroller, the pulse width modulated signal that you're going to be using to drive the motors. It's also where you connect a 5 volt supply for the logic, although this device is capable of 3.3 and 5 volt operation. As you can see, it's got a pretty big heat sink on it, but of course, considering the amount of power that it needs to dissipate, that makes a lot of sense. And so this is a great module that you can use if you want to drive a couple of really big motors. So here's the code that we're going to use with the DBH-12H bridge and if the code looks familiar that's not surprising because it's pretty well the identical code to what we used with the DRV-8871. The only difference is because we have two channels instead of one channel we have doubled everything up. So we define all of our inputs from IN1A to IN2B and all of these need to be PWM pins if you're planning on moving them around. We also also define an integer called fixed speed. At one point in our test we're going to run the motors at a fixed speed and we need a value for it. And don't go over 250 with that because as you recall this driver has a restriction about going over 98% PWM so you don't want to exceed that. Now in the setup we set everything up as an output and then we initialize everything as a zero so that the motors start off in a stopped condition. Now the loop is pretty well the 
the same as we did in the previous programs. We're going to accelerate and decelerate both forwards and backwards. So we're going to start by accelerating forward. So to set everything to go forward, we use the IN1 inputs. And so for channels A and B, we set those low. And then we put PWM on IN2. And for channels A and B, we do that. And we go from 0 to 200. Again, you could go up to 250 if you want, but don't exceed that. We delay for about half a second and then we decelerate and uh, same direction so we don't bother changing the direction bit. We just again manipulate the PWM on IN2 for channels A and B. And then we do it in reverse. We take IN2 on both channels and we set it low and we manipulate channel 1, IN1 with the uh, PWM for both channels A and B. And that will make the motors go in reverse and uh, decelerate, etc. And then after a short delay here, we move the motors in opposite directions. So we do IN1A and IN2B are set low, and then the opposite, IN1B and IN2A, are driven with PWM, and that'll cause them both to rotate, but in the opposite direction. And we're going to go at that fixed speed value that has a value of 80, as it says over here. We'll do that for three seconds, and we'll stop everything, hold it for two seconds, and then do the loop over again. So very simplistic and it should have no problem running our motors. So let's go and check that out. Now here I've got my DBH12 hooked up to a couple of high speed, high torque motors and I'm using my bench power supply to power everything up and although these motors can accept up to 24 volts I'm just giving them 12 because I need to be sensitive to the fact that this uh, module can only accept up to 14 and a half volts and so let's just uh, power up the Arduino and uh, get our demo going right now and there we go Speed up and slow down. Now we should change direction. And then we go at the steady speed. And we start everything over again. So the demo seems to work. The driver seems to work. And it's not a difficult driver to work with. It's not a lot of documentation for this one, but uh, as long as you know how to hook it up, it's a good choice because it's a fairly inexpensive and relatively easy to get motor driver. The IBT2 is a very powerful single channel H-bridge driver. This device is also known as a BTS7960. The IBT2 can handle a motor voltage from 6 to 27 volts. It can supply a continuous current of 30 amperes and a peak current of 43 amperes, so this can be used with very large motors. It also requires a logic voltage input of 3.3 to 5 volts. Now here are the pinouts of the IBT2. You'll notice there's a 4-pin terminal block on one end. This is for both the motor power and the motor output. There's also a two-row DuPont connector on the other side, and this is for the input. VCC is the logic level input and should match the level of the logic that you're feeding it. It can be from 3.3 to 5 volts. The IS signals are current monitor signals, and these can be used to monitor the current using an analog to digital converter. The enable lines must be pulled high for the motor controller to function. And there are two lines for PWM input. If you feed PWM into the RPWM input while keeping the LPWM input low, the motor will spin forward. You can hold RPWM low and feed the PWM into the LPWM signal to spin the motor in reverse. Now here's the hookup of the IBT2 to an Arduino Uno. Since it only uses the two PWM inputs, the connections are minimal, and you can use any connections on your Arduino, providing they are PWM capable. Note that the 5 volts in the Arduino is both supplying the VCC and also pulling up the enable lines on the motor driver. 
The IBT2 is a very powerful single motor driver. The device actually consists of two H-bridge chips and you can see them over here, but it is a single motor driver. The chips are run in parallel. Now over here we have a terminal strip and this is where you have both the motor output and the power for the motor. And on this side we have the input and the input is basically just the pulse width modulated signals that we're going to be using to drive the motor for forwards and backwards. It's also got an output for a current sense on this. Now if we flip it over you can see it's pretty well all heat sink over here but considering the amount of current that this has to dissipate that's not too surprising. So if you've got one large motor to drive this could be a good choice for it assuming it's not a super high voltage motor. And here's the code I'm going to be using to drive the IBT-2 or BTS 7960H bridge and it's identical code to the one that I used to the DRV8871 because you drive this motor driver in an identical fashion with a PWM signal on one input and a low signal on the other one and then you just reverse the inputs to reverse direction. So the only thing I did to modify this code is I changed the name of the constants that we're using over here to represent the inputs on the motor controller and then down over here I did actually make one other change I let the delay go to a thousand instead of 500 just to keep it running at full speed a little bit longer and that was just a personal preference but otherwise identical code so let's just load it up and check it out with our motor and here's our IBT2 demo and for this demonstration I'm using an automotive type motor. So this is a 12 volt motor with a gear train on it and this is the type of motor that you would use to drive the windshield in a car or in a truck. Now I'm using my bench power supply for this and it should be able to give adequate current for this motor. And so all I really need to do is get our Arduino powered up and we should be able to run our demo. And we hear the usual PWM whine, which we could change by changing the frequency of the PWM. And I've showed you in another video how to do that. I'm not going to do it today. But as you can see, the motor moves in one direction. It stopped. And now it's moving off in the other direction. And so it seems to work as advertised. Now it's a very easy motor driver to work with. It doesn't have too many connections and it has a pretty good current capability. So if you've got a mid-sized to large motor to drive, this would be a very good choice. Now the last motor driver that we're going to look at today is a bit unique among the drivers that we've seen and it's made by a company called Cytron. Now Cytron make a number of different motor drivers and all of them are very easy to use. Most of them just require a pulse width modulation input for the speed plus they use one bit to control the direction, high for one direction and low for the other. So they're very simple to use. They come in a number of different sizes and I found that they're very cost effective. I've been picking mine up at Robot Shop, but there's other places you can buy them as well. Now what's unique about the Cytron driver that we're going to be looking at today is that it's not just a driver, it's also a motor controller and you can use it in either mode. It comes along with a potentiometer and a two-way switch and you can use the pot and the switch to control the speed and direction of your motor without any external microcontroller. So if that's all you're trying to accomplish, you've got everything there in the same package. It even has an internal 5 volt supply which it provides as an output so if you are using a microcontroller you can power it off of this board. So let's go and take a look at the Cytron motor driver. The Cytron MD258V is a single channel H-bridge motor driver with an integrated motor controller. The device has a motor voltage of 7 to 58 volts. It can handle a continuous current of 25 amperes and a peak current of 60 amperes. The logic voltage is 3.3 to 5 volts. Now here's a pinout diagram as well as a truth table for this H-bridge. Note that the input is very simple. It just uses one pin called DUR to indicate whether it is going forwards or backwards and another pin called PWM for the PWM speed input. This device is also a motor controller and it has an input for both a speed pot and a direction switch. Note that this device has a 5 volt output. 
This can be used to power the microcontroller that you are using to feed the DUR and PWM signal. Now here's the hookup of the MD25HV. Note that the only connections in the Arduino are a ground pin, plus the PWM and DUR pins. You can use different pins if you wish, but of course the PWM pin needs to be a PWM capable one. Now the Cytron MD25HV motor driver is also a motor controller and you can see they've given you a potentiometer and a switch and these plug in over here and allow you to just drive a motor, control its speed and its direction without the use of a microcontroller or anything. So this can be a standalone device. Now despite the fact that this is about the most powerful motor driver that we're looking at today, it doesn't make use of any heat sinks. The largest components you can see are these two very large capacitors. It's a classic H-bridge circuit and you can see it's got four discrete MOSFETs being used for the H-bridge and that's how it dissipates so much power. It also seems to have its own processor on board. Now these are the connections for the motor power and the motor output. You connect your pulse width modulation and direction signals over here and there's a ground connection. There's also a 5 volt output connection over here here so you can use this board to power the microcontroller that you're using to drive it and again these are the two connectors for the potentiometer and for the switch so it's a very powerful motor driver if you need to drive a very big motor or one that uses a very high voltage this could be the ideal motor controller for you Cytron also makes a number of other smaller motor controllers that use the same scheme with a direction and PW input signal and they're quite inexpensive and they're available in both single and dual motor configurations. Now the Cytron driver slash controller is very easy to operate. It literally has an input for direction and an input for PWM so you could pretty well figure out what the code is. You drive a PWM signal on the PWM and you toggle the direction input high or low to change direction. And so the code for that would be very simplistic. What I want to show you is I want to show you a library that you can use for this motor driver. But not only this motor driver, it turns out you could use it with every single motor driver that we've used today and so that's pretty exciting I would think so let's go into our library manager and look for Cytron and we get a number of hits there are a number of things for Cytron but we're looking for ones that are from Cytron themselves and this is the one the Cytron motor drivers library by Cytron technologies and I've already installed mine and I'll show you what I mean about this library it's really great if we go into our examples and go down to Cytron Okay, your Cytron motor drivers. Look at that. We've got three examples, and if you look at them, you can see why I'm so excited about this. The first one is PWM underscore DUR, and that's what we need for this motor driver we're working with right now, because it has a PWM and a DUR signal. But below it, we've got PWM and DUR dual, and that means a PWM signal plus two control signals. So that's like the L298N type of motor driver. And then below that, we of PWM PWM dual and that would be for the previous motor drivers we've just looked at that have two inputs where you alternate a PWM signal from one to the other to change both speed and direction. So you could use this library with any of those drivers that we've used today. Let's open PWM DUR because it's the one that we want. And here it is right now. And it's very simple to use. You include the motor driver itself. And then you configure the motor driver. And you configure it by telling it which mode you want. So we want PWM DUR mode. And then you configure the two pins. In this mode, you would need to define two pins, the PWM pin and the DUR pin. And that's all that you do. There's nothing required in the setup. And there's really only one function over here. And by the way, this is your documentation because there isn't any documentation other than this even up on github you do a motor set speed now the way that set speed works is it goes from 0 to 255 to run the motor in a forward direction and then 
from zero down to negative 255 to run it in reverse. Obviously, zero is a stop in this case. And so that's what they do. They just show you different examples of running it at half and full speed forward, stopping it, and then running it at half and full speed backwards. So you can see that by doing this, you could write some code that would work with literally any type of motor driver, and all you would have to do is change this string up over here, this line of code to accommodate your other motor driver and you could write the code to work with any of them and this also makes it work by the way quite a bit um, like an ESC if you've ever used that or if you've ever used a continuous rotation servo motor only then for those it's from 0 to 180 not 0 to uh, 255 positive and negative but you could always use a map command to change one to the other so it's a pretty versatile little library let's uh, load it onto the Arduino and check it out with this motor driver and here's our final test setup for the day with the MD25HV. And for this I've got a very powerful motor. I'll turn it around so that you can see the specs on this thing. It's uh, 24 volts DC with a rated current at 14 amperes. So this is quite the beast. Now I'm not actually powering it with 24 volts. I'm going to use this LiPo battery. It's an 11.1 .1 volt LiPo. It's actually giving out about 12.5 right now because it's fully charged and that seems to power the motor just fine it'll work for our demo and of course the light pole will have no problem with the current now I've already got it hooked up to my Arduino and so all I need to do is give the Arduino a little bit of electricity and this motor is so powerful it jumps around now one thing that's probably a little difficult for you to see on the video is that down over here there are a couple of indicators on the Cytron board that say MA and MB and they indicate the direction that the motor is spinning in and they're alternating as the motor changes direction. Now since the sketch we're using runs it at two different speeds uh, we actually see two different brightnesses on here because it indicates the PWM brightness. Now I'm going to just disconnect the Arduino right now because there's a few other things about this I wanted to show you. So let's just unplug it and leave these wires not touching one another. First of all, without anything on the motor driver slash controller, they've got these two buttons here and they're test buttons and you can use them to spin the motor in one direction or the other direction. So when you've wired everything up, you can use that and that'll test your motor wiring, that'll test your power supply wiring, etc. And then of course, as I've mentioned a few times now, this is also a controller and so it comes with both a switch and a potentiometer and you can just connect those to it. So I'll do that right now. This is the switch down here. And the pot goes over here. And okay, I've got the switch in the pot. The switch is in the center position. Let's turn the pot down all the way. It controls the direction. The center is off. I put it this way and use the pot and I can control the speed of the motor. And if I want, I can flip the direction and do it in reverse. And so if all that you need is a motor controller that has just a direction switch and a, and a speed potentiometer, then this whole thing might be all that's required for you. You might not even need a microcontroller. But otherwise, this is a very versatile driver slash controller. And as you can see, it can handle pretty well any size of motor. It can handle motors a lot bigger than this one, in fact. And so hopefully between all of these different motor drivers today, you can find one that's going to be suitable for your project. So that concludes our look at motor drivers. I hope you enjoyed the video, and even more importantly, I hope it's opened your eyes up to a couple of different motor drivers that you could be using on your next DC motor project. Now, if you need more information about any of these drivers, or if you want to get some of the code that I used today, just head over to the DroneBotWorkshop.com website, where you'll find an article that accompanies this video, and there's a link right below the video to that article. And while you're on the website, if you have 
haven't yet, please sign up for my newsletter, my occasional newsletter that I send out just to let you know what's happening here in the workshop. And of course, it's free to sign up and all I need is your email address. Another thing that's free to sign up to is a DroneBot workshop forums where you can discuss motor drivers and all aspects of your projects with a number of like-minded individuals. And there's some great people on the forum having some great conversations and I'd like you to be part of that as well. And finally, the last thing that you need to do is there's a little red button right below this video. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you click that little red button, you'll be miraculously subscribed to the channel. And if you also click on that bell notification, you'll get notified every time that I make a new video, assuming, of course, that you've enabled notifications on your web browser. So it's a lot of stuff for you to do, but I'd appreciate you doing all of it. And so until the next time that we meet, please take good care of yourself. Please stay safe out there, and I'll see you again very soon here in the DroneBot Workshop. Goodbye for now.